All right. I'm excited about this morning. I'm excited about the word that God's given me. It won't be long, but it will be strong. Amen? Amen. And so what I want to do, this is kind of two parts this morning, is I kind of want to share biblically, what is our role as your pastoral staff? Amen? Wouldn't you like to know what our role is biblically in your life? And also, what is your role in the relationship? A lot of times we get frustrated in a relationship because we don't understand what the other person is responsible for. We have this expectation that it's like, ladies, you all expected that your husband was going to mow the grass, right? Because your dad mowed the grass. But guess what? He was raised in the city and he's never even seen grass. So you had an expectation when you're in that new house and that grass begins to grow and grow and you keep looking at him and he keeps looking at you. You have an unrealistic expectation on what that man is supposed to be providing. Amen? So I think the same thing happens sometimes when we talk about our pastors, our missionaries, the five-fold ministry, and what your role is in that also. Amen? So 1 Timothy 4.6, I've been spending a lot of time in 1 Timothy. And yes, we are going to hit pastor's favorite verse before we're done. 1 Timothy 4, 6, and if you're giving blood, does everybody know we also have a blood drive going on right now? If you would like to give blood, then you are free right now to go to our youth room, and uh, they have chairs that are available. Um, If you get up, if you just like give me a sign like you're going to give blood and you're not leaving because it's something that I said, that'll make me feel better. Amen? So if you're going to give blood, you are free at any point, whatever time you've signed up for, to go to the youth room and, uh, and do that. 1 Timothy 4, 6, if thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the word of faith and of good doctrine, whereunto thou hast attained. Out of the Berean Bible, it says, instead of if thou puts thou brethren in remembrance, it says, laying before the brothers these things. Laying before the brothers these things. Paul, who is the apostle of the day, is leaving Timothy, who is now the pastor of the largest church that there is. And Paul is giving Timothy instruction on how to pastor this church. And he said, Timothy, if you want to be a good minister, I want to be a good minister. Amen? My parents, we want to be good ministers. My wife, we want to be good ministers. Mike and Chesley, we want to be good ministers because at the end of the day, we're going to be judged on what we did with you during these times. Amen? And I want Jesus to walk up and be like, good job, Jack. Good job. You know, a couple of things we're going to work on, but for the most part, you were a good minister. So I got to know what that is. I want to make sure that my good and God's good line up to be the same thing. Man sometimes takes, you know, God and adds a zero and just makes it good. And I want to be a good minister. So I'm going to give you a little bit of Greek real quick. That word laying before the brethren is a word hypotithemy. Somebody will make a license plate out of that. Hypotithemy. And it basically means hypo means to uh, means under, and tithemi means to place or to set. It means to place under. Hypotithemi means to place under. What Paul was telling Timothy is, Timothy, your job is to lay a pattern underneath the people for them to follow. That's your job as a good minister. Your job as a good minister, Timothy, is to get underneath the people and lay a foundation. So my job this morning is I'm a foundation specialist. I'm here to work on your foundation. Not the most glamorous job in the world. Amen? I want to be a finisher. I want to be a roofer. I want to be, I want to be a framer. I want to build somebody that's got a trade. That's not what my job is. My job is to come in where you are, go underneath you, and reinforce the foundation 
so that you, when time comes, have something to stand on. Because the problem that we have today is people are frustrated with their Christian walk, they're frustrated with their Christian life because you're trying to walk in quicksand. You do not have the foundation of sound biblical doctrine that is inherent to all of us in order for us to grow. Amen? So we're going to do some foundation work this morning. My job is to set the Word of God under you. Now, in order to be a good minister, you know what God considers to be a good minister? It means, good minister means beautiful, it means noble, it means honorable character, it means good and worthy. It means attractively good, good that inspires and motivates others to embrace what is lovely. My job is to make Jesus beautiful to you. And the number one way for me to do that is to not just speak about it, it's to live it out in front of you. That's why pastors live with the people. I don't fly in or drive in on my golf cart, preach a little message, and then go and live my life apart. Pastors, shepherds, we live with the people. A big part of our ministry is for you to imitate our walk of faith. We are trying to set a pattern in front of you on how to live out the gospel of Jesus Christ and do it successfully. Are we perfect at it? Okay, once. No. No, because what? Because we're still working through our own salvation with fear and trembling. Amen? I'm, I'm, I have to renew my mind just as much as you do. I have to do, you know what? Does anybody just get up every day excited about love? Man, i got to work on that. That is just not something when I wake up, I've got to use my faith to love unconditionally. Because if I try and do it out of my own strength, it is frustrating, it is disappointing, and it's uh, unforgiving. So, it's my job. It is my job to set a pattern. Everybody knows when we built this building, they didn't just come in and just start pouring concrete on this foundation. What did they do first? They had to form it up. They came in with a pattern, and they set stakes all the way around the outside of the foundation of this building, and they formed it up. So when all the trucks started showing up, and they started making their deposit, that foundation, it went all the way to the ends of that form, no farther. That's what sound biblical doctrine is. It is the boundaries, it is the form in which God created us to live in so that we would be the most successful, so that we would be the most prosperous. Do you know that God wants you to be happy? Do you know that God wants you to be prosperous? Do you know that God gets no glory in seeing us suffer and struggle and stumble? He gets no glory out of that. He gets glory when a child of God in the worst of situations stands up and says, it is written. But the only way that we can do that is if we have a good foundation. Amen? You with me so far? We have to have a good good foundation. It's my job to teach the Word and give you a pattern to follow. Now, it took... Seven and a half minutes before me to get into diet and exercise. Okay, you ready? (laughs) At my gym right now, which is packed, it's January, every gym in Houston, Texas is packed right now with new people, with new clothes, with their little earbuds in, which is very irritating because they don't, you can't talk to them and instruct them because they got their little earbuds in. But everybody's looking for a personal trainer. Amen? I want a personal trainer. Now for me, to pattern my life, I want to find a personal trainer that I want to look like. There's a whole lot of personal trainers in my gym that are knowledgeable, that are sweet, that are kind, but they don't exercise. That is not the pattern that I want to follow in lifting weights. Amen? I actually look for the ones that practice what they preach. 
I'm not looking for the one that's full of head knowledge. I'm not looking for the one that has all the degrees. Those are wonderful. But if you've never applied anything that you've ever learned to help produce anything in your own body, what are you going to do for me? If you don't care about you enough, how about me? Well, to me, I'm just a paycheck. I'm just paying you for this knowledge. So it's the same thing for the minister of the gospel. You, we want to pattern our lives. See, we all need to be patterning our lives after somebody as they follow Christ. Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. That's a bold statement. Could we honestly look at somebody and say, follow me? Or we'd be like, all right, follow me, mm, nine to three, Monday through Friday. That might be a good time for you to follow me, but after three or four o'clock, you don't want to follow me. You know, follow me on the weekends, but hey, when Monday morning comes around, I'm in bad news. You don't want to talk to me on a Monday morning. Amen? No, no. We want someone to be able, we want somebody to look at our lives and look at the joy and look at all we have and say, that's what I want. You're following after Christ, therefore I want to follow after you. Amen? So, we want to follow people that are practicing what they preach. Let me just segue just for a second. You know, we're all teachers when we come here on Sunday morning. My parents are teachers. I'm a teacher. My wife is a teacher. Vincent and Jessica, teachers. Uh, Robin and Steve, we're all teachers. We all come prepared every Sunday morning and every Tuesday night to teach. Amen? We prepare. So let me just encourage you. Be very, very wise about what you ask of one of us before we speak. Be very, very wise in trying to share any of your most intimate or personal details or what you're trying to go through before we speak. Because you are pulling away from that teaching anointing that we've been preparing for to share with the congregation. When we come in the door and we start getting pulled in all these different directions, and I'll, I'll, pick, on, I'll pick on Brother Mike for a second. I love Mike. But Mike's a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Mike's not a janitor. He's not a handyman. He is a youth pastor at West Houston Christian Center. And he should be treated accordingly. I'm speaking to somebody right now. I'm speaking to somebody right now. We are all here to serve. But the first person we serve is Jesus Christ. And when we come here on the Sunday morning and we're prepared to preach or to teach and we get pulled 20 different directions because people didn't plan properly during the week and now it's convenient for you to come talk to us, that's a total disrespect and dishonor for the anointing of God. If there's something that you need from one of us on a Sunday morning, a Tuesday night, we are here Monday, we are here six days a week. We are here full office hours. If you need something, or you need something done, you need something put in place, you contact the church office and we will help you. We will make that happen. But you can't hit us on a Sunday morning or a Tuesday night before we go into the pulpit and ask us to start doing a bunch. You start pulling us. Come on. You start pulling us out of our anointing and it robs the people of what we've prepared to give them. God gave us something. He's given us a word. Don't you think anything from God is special? Amen. Don't you think that anything you get from God is precious? Amen. But when we get pulled to do 20 different things, all of a sudden, next thing you know, I, I didn't even get to teach today. Oh, that breaks my heart. Because I know what goes into this to teach. Smile. <laughs> the blood drives in there. It's not in here. <laughs> Smile real big. This helps us understand what our relationship is. Come on. If you need something, we're here for you. If you need counsel, we're here for you. But getting full-blown counseling on a Sunday morning, 10 minutes before a service, is selfish. You need to wait. Make an appointment. If what you have to talk about is so important, then make the time to call the church and make an appointment. Don't just show up. If it's that important to you, you cannot, does anybody just show up at a doctor's office? Does anybody just show up at a lawyer's office? Does anybody show up at the president's office? What do you have to do? 
Why do we do that? Because we honor their time. If you truly believe that we have the anointing of God and the ability to help you with whatever situation you're going through, then honor us enough to call and make an appointment and give us just a little synopsis of what you want to talk about so we can pray about it and we can be ready when you get there. Amen? But what happens is, is we turn into an ambulance service. Oh, I've got a problem. Wah! Go to the church. Go to the church. They're not doing anything. Come on. Man, I didn't plan on saying any of that. Thank you, Lord. Am I helping anybody? If you will value the man of God and the woman of God, if you will value them, then God will meet you with whatever your need is. But because we don't value the man or woman of God, because we think that our problem predicates it's more important than him having something for the whole body, that might be where the problem is. Come on. All right. Everybody got it? All right. 1 Peter 2.2. 2. As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. 1 Peter 2.2. 2. As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. Let me read it to you out of the Amplified. Like newborn babes, you should crave, thirst for, earnestly desire the pure, unadulterated spiritual milk that by it you may be nurtured and grow into complete salvation. Isn't that good? Listen to me. It is healthy, it is normal, and it is natural for a believer to crave the Word of God. It is normal... It is natural and it is healthy. Each one of us as a born-again believer, it is normal, natural, and healthy for us to desire the Word of God. Folks, it's the Word of God that is the foundation in which you're standing on right now. It's the Word of God. It's your level and depth of revelation in the Word of God is what you are standing on right now. And it can only come from one place, and that's the Word of God. Amen? It's the pure. It's what God created for the believer. In it, it's just like a mother with milk with a new baby. It is all the nutrients. It is everything that baby needs for a short period of time is in that mother's milk because in it is everything that you are going to need to grow. It has all the nutrients to keep you healthy. It can help ward off disease. It can do all of these different things, but it can only come from one place, and that's the Word of God. That's why it's so vital for us to crave, to want, to desire to spend time in His Word, to have the Word of God taught to us, to listen to the Word of God, to speak the Word of God, because in it is everything that you need. But this is what's happened. In order to make church more bearable, Till we can include more, we have taken people off the pure milk of the word and put them on a man-made formula. We have taken the pure milk of the word and we've changed it. Anybody ever had powdered milk? <laughs> that is nasty. Amen? But what we do, because we feel like sometimes the word of God, well, they can't take it all at once. There's not one baby that can't take milk all at once. I mean, that's the first thing they get in their system is the pure milk of the Word. It's the first thing. God didn't say give them a steak. God didn't say give them a banana. God said get them the milk first because if they get the milk first, they'll be able to understand what is right and what is wrong, what is good and what is bad, what is evil and what is good. But what we've done is we've gone to this, this, this chemically changed milk and we try and feed it down our congregation. And folks, that's why we're not walking in the power and the freedom and the deliverance. is because we're, le we're drinking a watered down version of what was supposed to be the pure milk of the word. Folks, no born again, spirit filled believer in any way, shape or form can read their Bible and find even a hint that abortion is right. This law in New York City, in New York State, folks, there is not 
But what happens is, is that in churches it's preached that it's the life of the mother, it's only in these circumstances. We take the pure milk of the Word and we have to alter it because... You wouldn't take it if it was the truth. If we knew the truth, we would never agree to such a thing. We would never let anybody harm a child, especially one that could be born the next day. Folks, our nation, we should be on our knees crying out to God. They are murdering children, and they don't even hide it anymore. It used to be this pretense. We used to have all these excuses, but they're murdering children on purpose. And the people in the Senate, they stood up and they applauded. Pray for these people. Pray for the governor of New York. Pray for those ones that that passed that bill. Pray for them because you want to talk about what they have unleashed upon themselves. The judgment and the curse. I don't believe me because I don't participate in it. What they have unleashed upon themselves... The Bible says a causeless curse cannot alight. Amen. A curse just can't alight wherever it wants to. There has to be a nest there for it. And what they have done is they have set themselves up for judgment. And our job as the church is we need to pray for them. Amen. We need to pray for these men and women because they're making decisions and they're so blinded by the Spirit. But, and, they're, and they call themselves Christians. If you were to ask them, they'd say, yes, I'm a Christian. But you can't be. Only if you would have drank some modified version of the Word could you ever come to that conclusion. I know this is so hard this morning. I didn't want to be hard. But my heart cries out. My heart cries out because people are deceived in thinking that you can live one way on a Sunday morning and act in a completely different way on a Monday and still receive all the blessings of being a born-again, spirit-filled believer. Amen? Amen. And that's not what it was supposed to be. Thank you, Lord. uh, Psalms 119.89. Psalms 119.89. It says, Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Amen? Amen? Forever, say forever. Forever is a long time. O oh Lord, your word is settled in heaven. Do you know what that means? And do you know why God did that? Things may change in the earth, but not in heaven. The word is established where man can't control it or change it. That's why God had to establish his word in heaven. Because if it would have been established here in the earth, We would have changed it by now. Amen? We try all the time. But see, he put it in a place where we couldn't get to it, where we couldn't modify it. It's established in heaven. The Constitution of the United States is established in the earth. Amen? That's why it's been changed so many times. That's why there's so many amendments. That's why there's so many changes to it. Why? Because it's been established here. God's Word has been established there. I can try and change it all I want, but I can't get to it. I can't make one change to His Word in any way, shape, or form. For you, O Lord, it is established forever. Amen? Psalms 119, 105. Your Word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. The Word is my guide. It lights my way, giving me direction. It gives wisdom for long range. The more time that I spend in the Word, in the pure milk of the Word, it's like my radar increases in my life. Before a radar, all you could see is just right here of where I was going. But the more time I spend in the Word, the more light that I have, the farther I can see down the path of where God wants me to go. If you're struggling with who you are, what you've been called to do, why am I here on earth? If you're struggling with any of those things, then I encourage you. Spend time in His Word. God wants to unveil and unravel this wonderful, beautiful life that He has for you. But it's only going to come to you through revelation. Revelation is light. You've got to have a revelation. How many of you are believing for transition right now in your life? How many know that you're in transition? Raise your hand, raise your hand, raise your hand. You feel like you're in transition. You know when you're transition, then you need revelation. 
that revelation is going to shine the light and show your path of where you're supposed to go and what you're supposed to do. It's the only way that it can come. I wish the laying on of hands would do it. I wish worship would do it. I wish prayer would do it. I wish fasting would do it. And those are all wonderful and powerful things. But it's only through us, you and I, individually spending time in His Word, is the illumination of the Word going to come to us where we can see where we've never seen before, where we can do what we've never done before. It's the source of all hope. It's the source of all joy. It's the source of all peace. It's the Word of God, and that's because God knew what we needed. Amen? He knew what we needed. Proverbs 6.23, for the commandment is a lamp, and the whole teaching of the law is a light. Reproofs of discipline are the way of life. I'm so glad the Word is there to tell me, to bring me correction. What's happened with through this genetically modified Word that's being preached today is we no longer call good evil and evil good. We've switched it. And the only way that you can do that is to modify the Word, to change the Word. The Bible tells me, have you ever been corrected by the Word? Man. It's kind of fun though, isn't it? You're like, ooh, did they just put that in there now? Because I've read that a hundred times. It's like somebody just came in here, it's like my shirt collars. I tell my wife, honey, somebody keeps coming in the college and tightening up the collars on my shirts. Find out who that is, because they're getting tighter and tighter. It's only the Word that can tell us what's right. It's only the Word that can tell us what's wrong. It's only the Word that can give you a clear path on how we are supposed to live in this earth. Amen? I'm almost done. Can you handle a little bit more? Psalms 119, 130. The unfolding of your words gives light. It imparts understanding to the simple. Let God's Word guide you, correct you, instruct you, lead you, teach you, and confirm you. I'll read that again. Let God's Word guide you, correct you, instruct you, lead you, teach you, and confirm you. Now, I want to finish with this scripture. Can we pull up 2 Timothy 4.2 in the Amplified so you don't feel like I'm making it up? Second Timothy 4.2. Let's be getting in verse 1. <clears throat> It says, I charge you, and this is once again Paul talking to Timothy, pastor of the largest church at that time, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by in the light of His coming in His kingdom. Here we go. Herald and preach the word. Now let me ask you, if this was Paul's last words to Timothy, do you think that they're most, that they're most important? What did he tell him? Timothy, lay hands on people. Timothy, pray. Timothy, fast. What did he say? Preach the Word. That was his last words to him. Preach the Word. Keep your sense of urgency. Stand by and be in hand and be ready, whether the opportunity seems to be favorable or unfavorable, whether it is convenient or inconvenient, whether it is welcome or unwelcome. You as a preacher of the Word are to show people in what way their lives are wrong. What's my job? And convince them and rebuking and correcting and warning and urging and encouraging them by unflagging and inexhaustible in patience and in teaching. That's strong, isn't it? Verse 3, for the time is coming when people will not tolerate, endure sound and wholesome instruction. But having itching ears for something pleasing and gratifying, they will gather to themselves one teacher after another to a considerable number chosen to satisfy their own liking and to foster errors they hold, and will turn aside from hearing the truth and wander off into myths and man-made fictions. Folks, we're here. That was written thousands of years ago. 
The truth isn't always easy to hear, but it is the truth. Now, what our job is, is to speak the truth in love. It's not my job to get up here and tell you how to live your life. It's my job to show you through a pattern. I can give you a pattern of 27 years of walking and living by faith. I got saved 27 years ago in February. I can show you, I can tell you what it's like to be walk and live in this earth for 27 years. I can tell you, I can give you a pattern of what it's like to live it off the word because I see it every day. I can give you a pattern of what it's like to have a godly marriage because Michelle and I have a godly marriage. We pray together. We talk the word with one another. It's not easy. I'm not easy to be married to. Nobody, you have to laugh at that. That was, that was not a, that was not a dramatic pause there. You weren't supposed to go, oh yeah, Pastor Jack, we've heard about that. You get two people in the room, you got two different opinions. There's, you're not, not everybody. Amen. Come on. Amen. You know, as long as there's more than one opinion. But what I can tell you is that I'm a user of this product. I have used the Word of God. It has been the first place in my life for 27 years. It is the most vital, important thing that I do on a regular basis. It's not just spending time in the Word for you but it's spending time in the Word for me. And I do it every single day. I cannot go a day without it, without the Word of God. I want to encourage us all to crave, to hunger, to thirst for the Word of God because in it is everything that you need for any situation that you're going through. And I'm done. Amen? Let's stand to our feet.